Hi. Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, this is uh, my... I've been coming here since 2012. When I first arrived here, there was only a few of us down on the floor, and, um, and I decided I want to try and sell this thing called augmented reality, and I've been now out there since 2012 um, meeting with uh, every single vertical that you can imagine, meeting with um, C-level executives, meeting with agencies, having whole agency um, uh, talks when I thought I was just speaking to three people and suddenly I'm in front of a hundred. Um, everyone's interested, but the key is how do you actually secure the investment to do campaigns? And to date, I've probably now done, uh, I don't know, maybe 70, 80, maybe more um, augmented and virtual reality campaigns. Um, uh, just a quick note, by the way, um, you might have seen our presentation this morning about Zapbox. We've just sold out within two hours, which is absolutely amazing down at our stand. Um, Zap are, are um, a UK headquartered company uh, that I joined about a year ago. I know all the platforms that are here today and I've watched all of them and looked for the best solution that could be consumer facing. Because for all the hardware and software in the world that is here today, unless you are getting augmented reality into the hands of consumers, you will not understand what turns them on and what turns them off. So this is really where AR and VR lives and dies, in the boardroom. And I've been in more than a few. Um, it's really, really important to understand the way the conversation is going to go in these environments in order to secure the investment you need to build something decent. And if they don't have enough money to build something decent, tell them no, come back when you have money. Because if I do something for you and you don't like it and it's not gonna actually achieve a business outcome, then you will not spend more money in this space and that would be tragic, um, most especially for your company with everything going on. So in terms of the, I, I guess the, the general path that I see happening um, quite often is you know, identify uh, a business with a communications or conversation problem. Uh, quite often a lot of businesses, uh, especially in the retail space, we deal a lot with retail, um, have a real problem bridging the online offline divide. And a lot of retail businesses say to me, we have all this like social success out here and all this web uh, success and then we have our bricks and mortar or then we have our, where our you know, service people are and we can't conjoin the two. We don't understand how one actually informs the other. And yet, there are supercomputers in everyone's pockets that will allow you to be able to join those two worlds and in fact turn what was offline, whether that's point of sale, it's packaging, it's anything below the line, into a highly measurable uh, media touch point, really. Um, it's important to find a champion with influence <laughs> within a company. Don't just find uh, a fanboy or fangirl of, of augmented reality who then is going to make you spin your wheels uh, forever inside the organisation and not get you in front of the right stakeholders. But when you find that champion, support them. Uh, support that person, help educate that person. Um, otherwise, you're going to end up in front of lots of stakeholders trying to educate them all a little bit of, at a time. But you find someone like, uh, you know, uh, like Joe and Michael, who um, spoke before from 3M, who are sort of agitators within their organisation for change, for seeing what's this tsunami that is coming around all this technology and hold on and support those people. And then it's uh, an interesting, um, and to what Alan was saying before from Deloitte, it's an, whether you go into sort of the sales and marketing side or whether you go into IT, sales and marketing will often do campaign-based stuff. They're just interested in going, yeah, let's have, blow everyone's minds and do something awesome and, and measure the impacts. Um, very hard then to get them to do campaign number two because we did something cool last month. What do we do this month? Um, is NFC still big? God forbid. Um, and IT then is really where you find you get the most traction, where they're interested in investing in platforms, in ongoing products, in really building an audience, um, which is super important. So you've got to identify both what are you going to do day one and then what you're going to do 12 months down the track. So few people talk about that. What are we going to do after this particular experience that we're creating? Whether it's B2B or B2C, how do we follow up the conversation? And also, what's really important is um, to the brand conversation, how, how can we um, integrate? Everyone just grafts AR or VR onto a brand strategy. They just try and plug it in at the side. Let's have something cool at our stand at an expo or let's have a little innovation center and they don't plug it into the omni-channel mix. So, and it's really, really important then to measure, to measure every single aspect of a campaign's engagement um, and analyse and then take it to campaign number two, campaign number six, campaign number 12. So some of the ways that 
um, some of the conversations that I have uh, with a lot of these big brands we work with, first of all, I talk about what's coming. I go, look, there is no secret that Apple have been working on this stuff for many years, probably longer than anybody else. They do have thousands of engineers. They will launch at some point. Um, they have spent the last few years getting their devices into big organizations. They're in a perfect position to then pivot those devices across the wearables. Um, and everyone knows augmented reality has really been taking off in the enterprise more than any other market. But I've wanted to stay in consumer facing because I think that's really something people aren't looking at. And Mark Zuckerberg, of course, everyone knows what he, he's um, done lately around the augmented reality world, but he says 3D is the obvious next thing after video. But in that, I mean, that's another conversation with brands is no one's creating 3D content yet, like extensive amounts of 3D content. And they're like, oh, do we have to pay to create 3D content? Well, you do, because this next internet is going to be an outernet overlaid upon the world. It's going to be interspatial, not just your logo, but every single aspect of your communications needs to now be in three dimensions. So I know Alan brought this up before, and a really good point, exactly the same point I make when I speak to our customers, that you know, you look at all the articles, what's cool right now, IoT right up there at the top of the, the curve. Um, you have machine learning, wearables, cryptocurrency, everyone's talking about Bitcoin. And here, right down the bottom here, is augmented reality and virtual reality heading into the mainstream. And I, I stood in front of uh, 300 of Australia's top retailers the other week, and I said to them, I said, so according to Gartner, and Gartner do not fluff about with the stuff they say to the, you know, people who pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to get access to their reports and everything every year. According to Gartner, by 2020, 100 million consumers will shop in augmented reality. Within 30 months, 100 million people who are consuming your brands today. And what have you put into this? Like, what, what investigations have you done? How can you build this out in 30 months? It's, for, for many brands in, in a number of industries, it's becoming very, very late in the day to activate and to really get this in front of consumers and start learning from what the consumers are enjoying about their communications. Uh, and I also talk about the disruptors. Everyone feels a bit disrupted by Amazon. Um, but, you know, I personally have a theory that um, Amazon, you know, is, is of course looking into virtual spaces, augmented and virtual reality. It just makes sense when they've got a huge product range and then they can put it into the hands of consumers virtually and then they can deliver it by drone or otherwise to their homes. And Alibaba, of course, um, Alibaba is now just leading the second or well, the latest round in Magic Leap. They are some of the biggest investors in the augmented reality world. So. The biggest issue is really numbers and scale as well. This is what a lot of people don't think about. They build out these demos. Anyone can build a beautiful demo. But how do you deploy that to hundreds and thousands of people, to millions of people? Do you know that Unity, if you have an augmented reality platform based on Unity or virtual reality, Unity does not serve well from the cloud into an app because you have to have behaviors in the app that actually match the Unity bundle that you're creating. So one of the reasons I, I joined up with Zappar a year ago is because they built their whole platform from scratch. It's super light. It's a three megabyte embed as opposed to Unity's 38 meg plus library, which brands hate. It's, it's a big payload in their app. Super light, and it's able to serve anything from the cloud very, very easily. Deploy to the cloud, pull into people's devices. The exact same reason why we've just been, been deployed in Shazam, in the Shazam app worldwide. And with 120 million monthly active users, we're now the biggest mobile augmented reality platform in the world at, at the moment. So to actually then give brands ownership of, you know, like a code set, be able to embed in their own apps, be able to scale their own solutions, this is the sort of thing um, that we're currently discussing with so many brands. And of course, um, you'll start looking for Shazam codes everywhere you go. Um, also, uh, we have a, a web publishing platform. Everything is super light, therefore, that, I mean, we were speaking to people who are buying Zap boxes today going, you can build experiences and just press publish and it's published. If you have ever tried to publish out of Unity or you want to make a change, you've got to unwrap the whole Unity bundle um, inside our platform. Everything like you see at the bottom there operates like Final Cut Pro. Um, it's a very, very quick way to create augmented reality. And another thing I say to, in a lot of boardrooms as well is, first of all, you need to show them that you have the experience. Unfortunately, there are a lot of cowboys out there right now. A lot of people who, and to be honest, they think they're doing a fantastic job. 
Um, but the problem is they don't have that experience. They're rocking up saying that they have photorealistic models and the models look like something from a computer game in the mid 90s. So it's really important to show brands that you have strong experience. And I really, in the last five minutes, want to jump into some case studies for you because this is really how I prove the ROI out on using augmented reality. So first of all, um, using an analytics tool like we have at the back end that can also go in straight into platforms like Salesforce, etc., is really important. Um, but just to give you some really good case studies, because this is going to arm you guys with the ability to go out to um, companies and say, look, augmented reality works. We, um, we have a little zap code system that we have because currently image recognition at scale sucks and doesn't work very well when you have um, like brand content that is similar vectors, similar logos. Um, after a while, basically, the image recognition will pull the wrong content in on top of the wrong piece of graphic or whatever. So we created this code system. Um, when you spent, I think it was maybe 50 Rand, could have been 500 Rand, not that familiar with South African currency, but when you spent a certain amount in their uh, NGEN service stations, it put one of our um, AR activating codes onto your shopper docket. So because people wanted to access then this gamification piece that we created um, off this code um, through the Zapar app, they uh, spent more to get over that threshold and access the code and the CFO of the company actually said it caused an 11% increase in sales over the initial three months and now we do ongoing campaigns with NGEN. Yeah, I think they're kind of the biggest um, uh, service station group in South Africa. Um, our most successful campaign on record was with Carrefour and NBC Universal um, over in France. We had, with collectibles cards, uh, 3.8 million zaps um, across 317,000 unique users. And what was amazing then is we actually replicated the campaign for Spain and have very similar stats about two months later. Um, great combination of the collectibles of good quality content like Minions um, and leveraging that against selling products off the SKU in supermarkets. Uh, but this is the one that I really like to refer to as I'm sort of uh, going to wrap up. But uh, this was a campaign we did for Woolworths in Australia, one of our biggest um, supermarkets. It was just a little printed A2 map that had codes that would unlock gyro games and all sorts of fun things for kids. Um, over the five weeks of the camp, six weeks of the campaign, we had 1.37 million zaps at an average dwell time of 74 seconds. So that worked out at uh, 91,000 uniques. So that worked out at one, almost 1.7 million minutes of engagement. So then what I say to people is, first of all, great momentum. You see the weekends where kids are playing a whole lot more, um, according to our Zapalytics platform. But what's really interesting, since the campaign finished, we're still getting 35,000 minutes of engagement from kids activating these maps almost six months down the track. If you paid for that, and I'll talk about this in terms of cost per view on YouTube, if you paid for that as a brand on YouTube, that would be, if Woolies were paying that, that would be $12,000 from Google every month that's payable, I think, on the 23rd. So, and we also saw the time of day. So we could see kids coming home from school, activating this, and then about 7 p.m. they were sent to bed, and then there's some naughty ones around about 9 or 10. So cost per view, at an average cost per view, and this is in Australia, on YouTube, 30 second forced is, let's round it at, um, it's between 13 cents and 40 cents, but in a competitive market, let's say it's 30 cents. So then I worked it out against the amount of engagement we got through the Zappar platform on these printed posters. And we uh, basically had the equivalent of a 30 second um, TVC or whatever of 3.376 million times that 30 second TVC. If they had paid for that as an actual like media click, that would have been over a million dollars. Um, they also paid three bucks each for these cheap little maps. So we really, I worked out we saved Woolworths in, in, in their normal, ordinary, acceptable media spend with a company like Google that everyone's happy to write checks to every day of the week. We saved them over a million dollars for the same amount of engagement that was done through mobile devices on pieces of paper. And I worked out across 90,000 7 to 12 year olds, which is who it was aimed at, it was about 7% of the Australian population, but their parents probably put them on the phones. So double that out to 180,000 people that we actually touched. Um, and 18 and a half minutes dwell time per consumer. So that's pretty much like a half hour TV show. So it's really important to then, when you're talking to these C-levels, tie all this in, tie it into their channels, be willing to talk to their agency, even though their agency might fear you a little bit. 
Um, and, and agencies don't yet realize uh, how much of share of wallets going to be taken by the AR, VR world yet, thank God. Um, tie it in, show it how it can work in their entire mix, and really more than anything else, as everyone is starting to focus on data, start to make them realize that when you get a consumer to point computer vision at a product, whether it's a piece of print advertising, whether it's consumer packaged goods, which is exploding right now around augmented reality, whatever they point at becomes a data touch point becomes a really, really precise data touch point too because people don't activate AR and then go and do something else like the cooking. So if we say 74 seconds, that is 74 seconds of physical engagement time with something that they would never be able to measure just a few years ago, which is really exciting. So I encourage you to come down to um, our stand, have a look at some of the things that we're doing um, at ZAPR, um, jump on to ZapWorks, start creating your own experiences um, go in and um, have the conversations with C-level executives and, um, and prove out the ROI and, um, and really f help them fight disruption because so few of them are ready for this outer net that is coming. So few of them are ready for an augmented world um, and really while it might be very painful right now, um, I'm certain that a year or two from now, so many companies that you laboured with and made them start their journey will turn around and go, holy hell, thank you so much. We would have been smashed if we didn't have a strategy around this um, now that everyone's got Apple eyewear on or whatever it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Oh, AR Australian, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Had it for a while. Oh yeah. How does FCP fit in the workflow? FCP? Uh, what is FCP? Oh yes? Oh Final Cut Pro. So uh, basically when you're creating a Unity scene and you unwrap a Unity scene and you change out all your little FBX animations and all that sort of thing, um, you wrap it back up and then deploy it to test it out in an augmented or, or virtual environment. Um, and then if you want to change something, you've basically got to unwrap it, you've got to unlock it, you've got to make sure that by taking one thing and changing it, it doesn't change everything else in the scene. The way that Zapworks works is every single artifact, every single animation is on its own separate timeline. So if you want to change anything, just one 3D object, just swap it out. You can go in, swap it out without, guaranteed it won't affect anything else, wrap it back up, and well, you don't have to wrap it back up, you just press the little orange button that says publish, and bang, you've published it to the cloud, you can share it with a client who's on the other side of the world if they have access to that zap code. So it's, it's just Unity developers, Unity developers hate letting go of Unity because they love the Unity Asset Store, they love the camaraderie of the um, developer community, but once they get in this tool and they've tried to do um, AR with Unity before, they find it really, really easy to work with, fully scriptable with JavaScript. <laughs>